Okay, welcome to the first week of Woof Code. I'm really excited to help all of you to learn how to code for the first time. This lecture will be a really quick introduction to the course, how we're going to structure everything. Um, I'll be giving an introduction to web development as a whole. We'll be talking about some of the fundamental concepts in web development, such as uh, how the internet works, how the web works, um, what is going on behind the scenes, uh, lots of this jargon that you might have heard of about clients and servers and front end and back end. And this week in your homework, you're going to be writing your first few lines of HTML code, uh, which is the code that runs the web that all web components are ultimately made of. So to start off with, I want to give a really quick introduction to the course. I'll be talking about who I am, what Woof Code is, uh, how it's going to work. Uh, I'll be talking about some of the material we'll be covering. We'll be talking about lots of the resources that you'll have available to you. So a bit of background about myself. I've been a web developer now for the past six years. I first learned to code as a student at Harvard University. Um, I'm currently the best-selling Udemy instructor, teaching JavaScript to thousands of students online. I work remotely, so at the moment I have a job as a tech consultant working for a company way out in Singapore. Um, it's one of the nice things about being a developer is that you can work pretty much anywhere and it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, and I think one last thing I would say about myself is that I really hate details. I think there are lots of technical people out there who really enjoy making things as complex and convoluted as possible um, and really enjoy the sense of, okay, I can understand something that nobody else can. And I'm really not like that. Uh, I think that if I can understand something in the simplest possible way, I really relish the idea that it's so simple. Um, so I'm not one of these technical people that uh, really likes to harp on about how, how difficult and how, uh, how smart they are for understanding things. I'm, I'm really not that person. Um, so a little bit about my teaching philosophy that kind of, um, kind of underpins how this course works. Uh, I came up with these three bullet points here that describe how I see learning pretty much anything. Um, I think the first thing that really resonates with me is that learning is really just a matter of exposing yourself to something and then practicing it. Um, there's this graphic here on the left that we can see, um, which says that back in 1821, only 12% of people knew how to read and write. Uh, you know, literacy was this thing that only a select few people could understand, uh, and they were like the, the most educated, uh, richest people in society. Um, and the vast majority of people didn't know how to read and write. Uh, today, that number is completely reversed. So only 12% of people can't read and write. Um, and I think the biggest thing that made this difference go down uh, is basically just that all students in all schools have to practice reading and writing pretty much exclusively for like 10, 15 years. Um, so I think it's not that people got smarter in the last 200 years uh, that means that this difference went down. I really think it's just a matter of exposure. Um, if you can keep plugging at it, trying to learn web development for two years, you'll see a massive difference. Uh, but you won't see that massive difference if you don't stick with it when it gets hard. Because um, at first, it's very easy to think that you can't do this and you just want to quit. Um, that's a really common, really common ex uh, experience. Um, but just sticking with it eventually, just exposure and practice, some of these concepts become easier and easier. Um, my second point here is that people tend to learn better if they're scratching some sort of itch. Um, that internally is motivated by some curiosity that you have. Um, if, you're, if you need to learn something for a project or if you have an assignment at work that would make it would be so much easier to do if you had um, some piece of technology you could understand, it's far easier to learn something rather than just learning absolutely everything about something in order. Um, rote learning for the sake of rote learning, in my experience, is quite a bad way to learn. Um, so yeah, so the course is made around uh, getting you to the point where you can learn this stuff for yourself 
uh, rather than teaching you a bunch of things that uh, you may or may not be interested in immediately. Uh, and then finally, I think that uh, I'm a huge subscriber to this whole 80-20 principle. Um, being able to learn just the bare basics that allow you to understand um, a lot more. Um, I think it's a lot better than learning absolutely everything about a subject. Uh, so for example, um, I always had this experience when learning languages, it's quite similar to learning programming languages as well. Um, that I'd spend, I probably spent about eight years trying to learn Spanish um, as a student at school. Um, and lots of this learning involved, okay, learning everything about a grocery store. So the name of every single vegetable, one after another, um, we have to memorize in this specific order. Um, but you never actually got to learn these really common words that you can plug into any sentence and actually understand things around you. Um, so two years ago, I learned German and instead I learned it by learning just the 500 most common words in the language. And this was immediately like 67% of all spoken German. So I could already uh, kind of stumble through conversations and that became way more motivating than having learned every single fruit and every single vegetable uh, in order of uh, kind of like a logical, logical layout that you might find in a language class. Um, so these are kind of the underlying principles that I'm using to come up with WolfCode's curriculum. Um, WolfCode is intended to be a broad introduction to web development. Uh, we cover a lot of different topics in quite a short amount of time. Um, the goal with that is just this sort of 80-20 thing of helping you to have like a really broad overview. Um, and with that broad overview, it's really motivating to say, okay, I just need to know this, 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 and I can already make the, the website that I want to make, for example. Um, and I see Woof Code as being uh, primarily sort of a motivation machine. Um, helping you to stay motivated for this one 10 week block uh, so that it becomes easier and easier to teach yourself and ultimately um, yeah, find your own uh, intrinsic motivation to learn more. Um, and yeah, by the, end of the, by the end of this course, you should hopefully know enough to teach yourself, know enough to learn more, uh, know enough to be dangerous, but not know everything totally by heart. Um, so in that sense, I would say that Wolf Code isn't necessarily the best curriculum that you could be teaching in terms of you know how the material is made um, just making this myself for example uh, you could also use something like code academy uh, but the great great advantage of woof code is that everything is together in one curriculum um, you're learning with lots of other students you get to uh, interact with a common curriculum talk to me talk to the other students um, and ultimately, uh, it should be easier to stay motivated for an entire period of learning something new. So on that note, um, you should hopefully have seen the syllabus already before starting this lecture. Um, but this is a really quick snapshot of everything that we're learning. Um, the course is 10 weeks. There's going to be one of these lectures every week. Um, hopefully it's going to be about 45 minutes of lecture, but sometimes that might go a little bit over. Um, I think usually most platforms out there, this sort of work would take you about 300 hours. Um, every one of these chunks would be at least like a 10 or 20 hour, uh, unit. Uh, if you're learning on free code camp or learning on code academy, um, in this course, it's designed to be between 20 to 100 hours. Um, so this would be between two hours a week and 10 hours a week. One of those hours is watching the video. Um, so hopefully that's quite motivating. Um, of course, you're not going to know this as well as if you were taking uh, free code camp or if you were taking, um, if you're taking uh, code academy, doing this all totally by yourself. Uh, but as I said, it's a broad introduction. Um, you're going to learn things about both front end and back end, uh, expresses and back end libraries that should hopefully become uh, make more sense at the end of this lecture. Um, and yeah, you should be able to understand lots of things about computer programming, um, which is a great introduction before taking a deeper dive by yourself. Um, something really important that I want to stress is that consistency is really key in learning computer science uh, and learning web development. Um, the course is designed so that if you put in one week, one hour of effort every week, 
it'll be way more useful than if you put in 10 hours in the first week and then nothing in the weeks after. Um, you can imagine with the, the first graph on the left, somebody who, who started out really excited, but then something came up in their life and they can't keep a consistent effort throughout the weeks. Um, this person would know quite a lot about HTML, but basically nothing about React or Express. Um, wouldn't have done any JavaScript and probably wouldn't really have felt that they knew any more about web development than when they started. This person on the right would have a broad introduction to lots of these different technologies. And even if they didn't know any of these technologies especially well, um, they would at least have a good sense um, for what's important, what they want to learn more about. Um, and going forward and learning more, this person would be in much better shape. Um, okay, so in order to help with that, uh, I've devised something called group chats, which you might have also seen from the syllabus. Um, the concept with the group chats is that it's sort of like an accountability group that you'll get put in with other students. Uh, it's totally optional, just in case you just want to watch the videos and do the homeworks and you think that you can motivate yourself, that's totally fine. Uh, if you want access to these group chats, the deal will be that you pay a flake tax. So this is a refundable fee if you complete um, over six of the calls. Um, then you'll get matched into a group with other students. So it should be between about four and ten other students. Uh, once a week, you'll be scheduled to have a group chat with the other students that you're matched with. And there'll be some, uh, some exercises, uh, a chance to kind of show off the work that you've been doing in the class, a chance to ask questions. Um, totally sort of self-driven um, by the people who show up. Um, and it's a way of just sort of like keeping yourself accountable to say, okay, I'm going to do 10 weeks worth of stuff. I'm going to show up to all these group chats uh, and there's some sort of pain that I'll, that I'll experience if this doesn't work out. Um, so again, totally optional. Uh, there'll be instructions in this week's homework if you want to get involved with these. Uh, it should be a great way of just keeping yourself, keeping yourself motivated. Um, so for asking questions, hopefully all of you join the Discord server. I mentioned this in the last email. Uh, Discord is a chat application, which is totally free. Uh, it's a really awesome product. Um, originally developed for gamers, um, but it's basically like Slack. If you've used Slack before, a uh, really simple messenger for groups. Um, there's a Discord server that I set up. The purpose of this server is to ask questions. So we have uh, a different channel for every week. Uh, and if you have any questions about this week's content, you can post a question there and I'll try to get back uh, within a day. Um, another option, if you want to get help, is the office hours. Um, so the deal with the office hours is that I will be on a Zoom call like this once a week for one hour. Uh, and anyone can show up and ask questions uh, and I'll field those questions and try to help to under you to understand this material in a way that I couldn't possibly do during lecture. Um, so this is a really great experience if you're looking for some sort of a tutor, if you want a little bit more hand-holding as you're learning this material, if any particular questions show up. Um, and generally, if nothing, if nobody has any questions, but just wants to show up and sort of absorb some information, then I'll have sort of a miscellaneous rant that I've prepared uh, in, in the event that, that there's no questions that directly relate to this week. Um, so that's a great option. I would really recommend checking out the office hours. If that time of Sundays at 4 p.m. doesn't work for you, um, if you're based in, I don't know, like Australia, for example, and you can't make that time for whatever reason, um, then I'll also do these on request. So you can also just send me a message on Discord. Uh, we'll come up with a time that works for us and we can add another block of office hours to the next week's uh, schedule, basically. Uh, okay, one of the other, one of the other materials, the, la the last material I want to talk about is the booklet site. Uh, which is newly available on woofcode.com. 
the deal with the booklet site is that all of the course materials that will be discussed in lecture or all of the homeworks will be available on this site. You can just click on the particular week. This isn't live yet. Um, I'll be updating all of the material later today. So when the homework gets released, which will be the end of today, um, and the notes, uh, and the slides, and this video, uh, all of that should be available on the booklet site. Uh, so if you're ever looking for anything related to related to the course, then just go to woofcode.com slash learn, and you can find everything there. Okay, so that was a little bit of broad introduction about the course. Hopefully you're all really excited to learn something about web development. Um, and with that, I just want to give um, the rest of this lecture um, we'll be explaining some topics that are going to come up all the way through this course. Um, and this should hopefully be a really good introduction to web development. Okay, so before I get started, I want to just kind of clear up some common misconceptions about programmers, about web development in general. Um, I think in general, when people think about programmers, they think about one of the two gentlemen on the left here. Um, they generally think, okay, programmers have to be these like ludicrously smart prodigy people um, who are kind of boring, who can't talk to girls. Um, and they're, they're always men as well. Okay, this is like the common stereotype of programmers. Uh, and I just want to try and dismantle this a little bit. Um, I think these two people, they really stick out because they're like total outliers, right? Um, so the, these two people are con these computer prodigies that have been coding since the age of five or whatever. Um, but that's not at all what 90% of developers actually look like. Um, developers are generally pretty normal people. Um, there are lots of developers that are girls. Um, and I'd really like to stress that programming isn't at all a boring activity. Um, the kind of work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day level if you become a developer, uh, it feels a lot more like doing a Sudoku, um, doing some sort of puzzle, like playing your way through a crossword. Like this is the kind of activity, the kind of feeling that you get from doing programming. Um, you almost never feel like you're doing actual work. Um, so if you compare the job of a programmer, which is always sort of playing around with something, getting something to work, um, solving this puzzle, um, that's there's a, there's a more creative, fun, awesome job than um, filling out spreadsheets or doing some copywriting or something. So I really want to try and uh, try and get that into all of you guys that are, that it's a, it's a fun job. It's a fun thing to do. It's a, it's not at all a boring activity. Um, the last thing I have here, this is a really common misconception. Um, the programming involves being good at math. Um, lots of people will say, well, you know, I would love to be able to do web development, but I'm not really a mathsy person. Um, could never really understand maths. It's not for me. Um, but programming involves like a laughably small amount of maths, um, which, which always makes it kind of funny when people make this connection. Um, the most maths you'll ever need to do in computer science is uh, like arithmetic operations. So like, okay, what is this number plus another number equals another number? That's like an arithmetic operation. This number is smaller than another number. Um, that's literally as complicated as maths gets. Um, what I would say computer science involves is logic. Um, so you could imagine playing a game of chess, for example, or playing a game of Monopoly. Um, doing a Sudoku puzzle is a great, great example of the kind of mental work that's involved in computer science. Uh, you can think of logic, but I wouldn't worry about um, being good at maths or not. Um, these are two kind of, two totally separate things and, and it's, it's totally okay to be bad at maths. Like I'm not great at maths either. Um, so yeah, don't make, don't make, <laughs> don't, don't uh, disqualify yourself because of, any of these misconceptions. Okay, so um, to kind of introduce web development and computer science in general, um, the first thing that I always like to talk about is this word called abstraction. Um, so the basic concept between, behind abstraction uh, is that we're able to use things and do things with a technology without completely understanding how that technology works. 
Um, so there's this awesome quote by Isaac Newton um, that says, okay, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think this really well uh, encapsulates what this word abstraction means. Um, we don't need to know every detail about technology uh, for us to be able to use it, uh, which I think is something really exciting about web development. Um, so for example here, um, a great example of abstraction is driving a car. Um, so probably lots of you, maybe even most of you in this lecture have probably, probably have some experience of driving a car. Um, and if you think about what a car is, it's actually quite a complex machine. Um, if you've ever looked under the hood of a car, you know, you'll see all of these sort of pipes going everywhere and all of this mechanics and there's so much stuff that you could plausibly understand about a car. Um, but the great thing is lots of you can still drive this car without understanding what's under the hood. Um, all that's relevant to you as the driver is what's called the interface. Um, so you know how the steering wheel works, this thing in front of you, and if you turn it this way, then it goes left, or if you turn it this way, it goes right. Um, you have a gear stick that if you're driving a manual car, then you can kind of, another layer of complexity there, or um, uh, you know, you have the, the, the gas pedal, or you have the brakes. Uh, if you understand these, these little, this little interface, which is like, you know, a few, a few things do this and a few things do that, um, then you can drive this, drive this car without, without knowing what's going under the hood, um, which is really awesome when you think about it. Um, it allows us to do way more powerful things uh, and build on the technology of others, build on other smart people's work um, to, to make real changes in the world. Um, and this is a really common pattern that we see a lot in computer science. Um, we often have something like this, where there's this sort of magical black box that we don't really need to understand. Um, we just know that, okay, there's some sort of inputs that this black box expects. And if we give it these particular inputs, we'll get some sort of output. Um, and you could think of this black box as being sort of like an algorithm. Um, we have lots of these algorithms in computer science that we can use uh, without necessarily understanding the details of how this algorithm works. Um, so in the example of a car, let's say the input is turning the steering wheel left and the output is the car follows your steering hands and moves left as well. Um, something really common in uh, web development uh, as an illustration of abstraction is this concept of a library. So a library is a collection of code that's been sort of pushed together into a file that anybody can use in their own projects. Um, so for example, there's a really great library that maybe we'll get to use in this course actually um, by Google for their Google Maps, uh, Google Maps service. Um, so anybody can get one of these awesome Google Maps uh, you can place pins on them, you can uh, zoom to a particular place, uh, all using some simple code that Google gives you. Um, so the interface looks like this. There's maybe like five lines of code down here. And if you just plug those five lines of code in your files, then you get one of these shiny Google Maps pop up on the screen, uh, which is awesome because if you wanted to design one of these maps by yourself, then it would take literal months. Um, but instead of us having to do that from scratch, we can use Google's awesome uh, team of front end engineers and designers and super smart people to get this for us. And all we need to know is a few commands that we need to write in our JavaScript and suddenly, suddenly it's there, suddenly it's ours all of a sudden. Um, so that's abstraction, just uh, a really awesome concept in web development that I want to start off with. Um, and the great thing is uh, you can make something super cool, super awesome, without needing to, to kind of know all of this super technical jargon that's going on underneath it. Um, so you can see all of these companies on the screen here, all of these massive startups, uh, massive tech conglomerates really now. Um, all of the technology that goes behind these products uh, is extremely simple. Um, Airbnb, LinkedIn, Facebook, 
uh, they're all using really simple stuff uh, that you learn about web development. You could even learn in this course. Um, but they're doing new and innovative things uh, with this stuff uh, and creating entire tech companies uh, on top of it. Um, so that's something that really inspires me that I think is awesome about computer science uh, and hopefully something that's interesting to all of you uh, just starting out this journey. Okay, so that's a broad introduction of some, some web development concepts I'm throwing at you all. Um, so the first bit of actual teaching I want to talk about uh, is about the internet and the web. Um, these, are, these are kind of two fundamental um, kind of fundamental concepts that are really important to know about uh, before we get started writing actual code. Um, because sometimes we'll, we'll kind of need to, we'll need to know some of this jargon that'll pop up in the next few weeks. Um, and it's good to get some exposure to it uh, immediately. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about the internet. Um, the internet and the web are kind of pretty often used pretty interchangeably. Um, but the difference is the internet is basically just a network of machines. Uh, the internet was first invented by the US military back in the 60s. And we basically have a situation that looks like this. Uh, you have one computer that's connected by a physical cable to another computer. And these computers are part of a network. Um, the first internet was kind of a United States wide network called ARPANET. Um, but currently there's a network connecting basically all computers in the world. Um, your computer is probably connected to the internet through a router, which is this kind of box that should be somewhere in your house. Um, and that router will have a physical connection to my computer's router. Um, there's even a huge wire running underneath the Atlantic Ocean that connects the United States with Europe. Um, so even today, there are just there are basically just these computers that are connected by physical wires, and every computer on the internet has a unique address which you can send things to. So this address you can think of as just like a regular address. Um, like, you know, number four Privet Drive, uh, you could send something to Harry Potter if you know the address. Um, if you know the computer's uh, sequence of digits, which is called an IP address, then you can send a packet of information to that computer. Um, so this was like, this was the entirety of the internet for probably about 20, 30 years, something like that. Um, we could always be able to send information from one computer at a distance to another computer as long as they were connected by wires. Um, the web is something different. Um, originally conceived of the World Wide Web uh, by this guy, Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and he was a scientist at CERN. Uh, and the web essentially looks like this. Uh, rather than having one computer connecting directly to another computer and sending some files, you have one type of computer that's always waiting uh, to receive a request for a file, which it can immediately respond to. Um, and these computers are called servers. Um, so something to bear in mind here is that although we've made this sort of like, there's a kind of this diagram here of what a server actually looks like. Um, but at the end of the day, you can actually have a computer that looks just like this being a server. Um, so a server might look like something kind of confusing or technical um, because it looks like this, but this is essentially just another computer. Um, you can even make a server on your local computer. Uh, we'll actually be doing that in this course. Um, but all the server's doing is that it receives a message and it responds to that message. Um, and the uh, computers that are asking for something, that are making a request, are called clients in this World Wide Web universe. Um, so we have multiple of these clients that can connect to this server. Uh, it can ask for files, and the server will respond with some sort of information, some sort of response. Um, OK, so the building block behind the World Wide Web is this concept called hypertext. Um, 
so hypertext, uh, we can think of when Tim Berners-Lee was first developing the World Wide Web. Um, the reason why he created it was because he wanted to make scientific articles more available to people working at CERN. So CERN was this giant, still is this giant, uh, giant research, uh, research venture uh, by the European Union um, with sort of thousands of super smart scientists working together on all kinds of breaking edge science. Um, and back in the 1980s, it was possible to find research papers that all of these scientists were working on through the internet. Uh, but you'd need to sort of manually ask around and try and find the right IP address to request things from. Um, so this was a super unwieldy experience of, okay, I'm working on physics and I need to find uh, this particular physics paper to help my research. Uh, I need to ask three people to figure out what the right link is to find this particular paper. Um, Tim Berners-Lee came up with this idea of hypertext which is basically like there's a text document um, it could just basically look like a Microsoft Word document basically um, you can have images you can have bullet points you can have um, you can have just regular text and inside of that text you could have links hyperlinks that can navigate to other websites um, so this is basically what we mean by the net or the web um, you have this sort of interwoven uh, mesh of websites uh, where there are these different text files that link to other text files. And you can do this thing of like sort of surfing the web between different pages. Um, and this works to uh, sort of an easier way of indexing all this information and making it uh, sort of more consumable to the average user. Um, so yeah, so these hyperlinks um, all kind of link between different served websites from these servers. Um, so you can imagine going to wikipedia.com on the entry for Facebook, and there could be a link to facebook.com, which will take you to Facebook's web page from Facebook server. Um, and that could have a link to Google for some reason. Um, and then on Google, you can find every site linked in the uh, search results, basically. Um, so this is hypertext, this is the web. Uh, at the time, this was a totally groundbreaking new idea uh, that totally revolutionized how we can consume content online. Um, okay, so that's hypertext, that's the web. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is hypertext transfer protocol. Uh, so HTTP. Um, this is a really important concept for web developers. Uh, it always comes up. Um, the way to remember this is that hypertext is these special types of documents that Tim Berners-Lee created. Um, and transfer protocol means, okay, it's the way that we can, um, we can deal with transferring these documents between machines. Um, so a protocol is basically like a convention. So uh, the protocol when I meet you for the first time is that I stick out my hand and then we have this handshake. You can think of like a handshake as being like a protocol. Um, IP address incidentally stands for internet protocol, uh, which is like the protocol of accessing the internet. Um, so IP stands for internet protocol. Um, this word comes up quite a lot in, in web development. Um, okay, so the basic idea is the convention for two machines sending packets between them, sending information, is that the client will send the server an HTTP request. Um, so these are two computers that are connected by this cable, this physical cable connects them just like in the old days. Um, and the client can send a request to the computer. Um, in this case, it's a get request or a few different categories of this request that we can, that we can talk about. Um, the client sends a request and the server will, spend, will, will send a response. Um, so in this case, the client is asking for an image of a cat as an HTTP get request. Um, it plugs in the address that it expects to find that server. And then the server responds with 
the resources that the client was asking for. So in this case, it responds with a JPEG file of a cute little kitten, for example. Um, this is basically the building block dynamic that the web always works with. Um, and then we can talk about two different sections of the web, sections of code um, between, uh, between this whole dynamic. Um, the first is called the front end. So uh, we've been talking about these as clients, clients that are connecting to servers. Uh, another almost synonymous word that we use with clients is front end. Um, so the front end of a website is the stuff that the end user sees. Um, so this could be logging on to facebook.com and seeing like a particular UI, for example. That's all front end stuff. Um, it's quite synonymously called the client um, because it's the code that actually runs on the client machine. Um, so when you visit facebook.com, uh, you have an HTML file that's downloaded to your computer and you can see that through this web browser. Um, it's important to note that these clients, these front ends aren't always a computer that looks like this from the 1990s. Um, it turns out that a client can be pretty much anything um, as long as it's interfacing with a site through a web browser. Um, so these days, uh, I think more than half of all web traffic is through mobiles. So if you're using an iPhone, you're using an Android phone, um, you're connecting to facebook.com on your iPhone, um, then it's still treated in the same way as a client. Uh, your phone is still making an HTTP request to Facebook server and it's getting back a response. Um, and it can even be like a TV, for example, like a TV is also a client. Uh, if you have a smart TV that can connect to the internet, it can access Google Chrome. Uh, that also counts as a client just the same as, as any other computer from the 1990s. Um, so something about the front end, uh, these are the technologies that you typically find uh, as a front end developer. Um, so we have front end developers and back end developers and a front end developer always uses HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Um, these, these three are basically the bread and butter of front end development. Um, and typically these days you would use one of these three frameworks as well to make your job easier. Um, so these are all called front end frameworks. Uh, the three most popular are Angular, React and Vue. And these make it easier to build uh, reusable components that you can stitch together to, uh, to make it easier to uh, program as a developer. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be introducing React in this course as our front-end framework, uh, but we'll end up kind of using all of these technologies together through the course. Um, and on the back-end side, uh, the back-end refers to the code that's running on the server. Um, so the code that's reacting to, okay, if, if a client asks for this particular document, then you need to give that document back. So there could, be, uh, there could be something set up in this case on the server uh, so that the server knows if I get a request asking for a cat, then respond with this particular, uh, this particular file, which is stored on the computer's hard drive, basically. Um, and part of the job of a server could literally just be to um, look something up that's actually physically on the hard drive of the computer that is hosting the server. Um, or more commonly, the server could ask for something from a database, which is stored somewhere else. Um, but okay, backend code is pretty much entirely reacting to the client, uh, responding to requests, and uh, handling the logic under the hood. Um, so the, the querying and editing of the database, the uh, calculations of business logic, things like this. And the technology for the backend is you can pretty much write a backend in anything. Um, so generally as a backend developer, you would choose one of these uh, languages here. Um, so we have Go by Google is a really, really new, uh, really new server side language, which is one of the fastest. Um, you can also use Python on the backend. 
Um, for JavaScript, you can use Node.js, which came out in the last five years or so, 10 years or so, um, which is quite a fast one and also means that you don't need to learn two totally separate languages to be a, to be a, a total developer that knows both front end and back end. Um, or there's also Java or PHP or Ruby on Rails. Um, so there's lots of different opportunities for backend developers. Pretty much you can just pick any language that you want and you can write a server to respond to requests in that language. Okay, so looking at these two, two different paradigms together, um, we have the front end and the back end. Um, a really good analogy to remember to figure out the difference between the two is that the front end or the client side of a website is sort of like the uh, sort of front of shop of a restaurant. Um, so if you walk into a restaurant, you have a certain user experience, um, which is common to every restaurant. Um, you know, you'll, you'll sort of walk in and you'll get seated at a table and a waiter or waitress will come to your table to take your order. Um, you'll get a menu that you can choose between all sorts of uh, different dishes that are on the menu. Uh, you pick something and then eventually the food comes and then you eat the food. Um, so there's sort of a whole side of the restaurant that you see as a user, um, as, a, as, a, as a client. Um, and uh, there's another entire side of the restaurant that's going on behind the scenes as well. Um, back in the kitchen, uh, there are all sorts of different jobs that are being performed by people in the back, um, which actually makes everything happen. Um, so on the, in, the, in the sort of back of the shop, um, in the kitchen, um, somebody needs to make sure that the oven is preheated to the right temperature. Somebody needs to cut the vegetables. Um, somebody needs to prepare the sauces. Um, and all of this is a very different kind of task to what's going on at the front of the restaurant. Um, both of these sides of the restaurant need to happen in order to actually service a whole person's meal, um, but they're different kinds of work. Um, so that's quite a good analogy between client side and server side. Um, there's sort of this user centric client side uh, with the, you know, ordering the food and getting the menu. And there's this sort of like behind the scenes uh, underground stuff that's happening on the back end in the server side. Um, so this is, the, this is the analogy to remember just to get a feel for how different these two, these two things are. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about with, um, with these, these two stacks, these two sort of different, different things um, is that there's this word called full stack developer. Um, which encompasses knowing something about the front end and something about the back end. Um, and a full stack developer can essentially program on both the front end and the back end. Um, so a stack is like a collection of different technology, like a tech stack. Uh, that's where this word comes from. Um, and yeah, so a full stack developer means that you equally know all the technology on the entire tech stack of the company, which is both front end and back end. Um, and typically this will happen if the back end is programmed in Node.js. So in this case, a front end developer knows JavaScript uh, because JavaScript is used on the web. And with that JavaScript knowledge, they can also put that same information to use um, to help program the back end as well. Um, so that's not super important, but it's just a nice little term to know. At the end of this course, you should all hopefully be full stack developers, at least in, in some degree, which is quite exciting. Um, you can really start boasting about knowing, knowing way more than just those regular front end developers. Okay, so as I mentioned already, uh, on the front end, we have these four different types of technologies. Um, this course, we teach a little bit of back end, week nine, week Week eight, we talk about Express, um, but mostly this course will be focused on the front end. Um, so HTML, I wanna talk about a little bit this week. Um, CSS, we'll talk about next week. Um, in a few weeks from now, we have maybe like four lectures just on JavaScript, three lectures on JavaScript. Um, and we'll also be introducing React, uh, as I mentioned already. Okay, so 
HTML, uh, the last thing I really want to talk about in this lecture um, is giving you like your first introduction to any kind of computer code that we actually get to write. Um, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. So thinking way back when we talked about hypertext, uh, HTML was also invented by Tim Berners-Lee at the same time as HTTP and at the same time as, as this hypertext stuff. Um, and hypertext markup language, HTML, is the, is the sort of building block, the stuff that you write these fancy HTML, these fancy hypertext documents, um, you make them with HTML. Um, so you're marking up uh, you're marking up these text documents into something that can link to other documents and show images and stuff like that. Um, so that's a really quick introduction to HTML. Um, in this lecture, I just want to sort of break down what that looks like, um, show you some real HTML code. Uh, and in next lecture, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, and we'll also talk about CSS, which is sort of goes alongside HTML in the same, uh, in the same way. Okay, so this is a really rough introduction. This is sort of like a really basic introduction to um, an HTML block of code. Um, so an individual unit of HTML is called an element. So the whole thing here is an element and an element involves an opening tag and a closing tag. Um, so you can kind of see this, this sort of like these like two uh, brackets, these two like sort of pointy brackets next to each other. Um, this is sort of the outside of a tag. Uh, it's also if you've seen the woof code logo, it's like what's around the dog. Um, if anyone was just thinking that was like cool minimalist design, there's actually some some meaning behind it. Um, <clears throat> so typically HTML involves uh, an opening tag, some sort of content, could be text, could be other HTML tags as well. Um, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. And then uh, we can see the end of an HTML element is sort of like the same pointy brackets, but then like a slash before it. Um, and the whole thing together is called an element. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the terminology. Um, you'll hear lots of this jargon over the next few weeks of like an element and a tag, an attribute and a property. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about what everything's called. Um, I would just sort of get used to the, the sight of these elements, what these sort of look like. Um, eventually this jargon will come with time. Um, but for now, what's important is that you could you could ultimately just look something up and see, okay, yeah, that's how that went. This is what this is called. I remember now. Um, I wouldn't worry about rote learning everything off by heart at this stage. Um, it'll all come through osmosis, just seeing this stuff for enough time. Um, okay, so this is one element of HTML. A website is basically lots of these HTML elements mushed together. Um, another thing we have in HTML elements is something called an attribute. Um, so we have a name of an attribute and then some value of an attribute, um, such as this. In this case, this is a class attribute that we're adding in. Uh, a class is something specific that we use with CSS uh, to sort of track elements on the page. Okay, they're in the same class. We should style them in, in similar ways. Uh, in general, an attribute provides additional information about a particular element. Um, so some of the most useful attributes that we have with HTML elements, for example, is an image tag, an image element, an image HTML element uh, requires like a source attribute, which is like a link to where the image is found. Um, so that could be like some cat picture on Google, uh, you could find the URL that goes to a t particular image, and then you could just include that in an image tag source attribute, and then it shows up on the screen. Um, this should become more obvious when we actually write some HTML this week. Um, you'll have as part of the homework this week, uh, there's an opportunity to uh, code along by yourself in an online editor. 
And uh, one of these exercises will be writing an image tag, for example. Um, so there'll be some tutorial alongside the exercise, which will show you how the syntax works. Um, but in general, just as a broad overview of HTML, uh, we have lots of these attributes that we can use, and we just have a name of an attribute, so in this case, a class, and we're setting it equal to some value. Um, so here, the, the class has, the, the, the P tag has an attribute called class, and we're setting that class equal to editor-note. Um, and then we can do things uh, with that later. Okay, uh, and the last thing I wanna talk about with HTML is just broadly what things look like. Um, so this is the same code that exists on pretty much every website. This is what all HTML scaffolding looks like. There's always this doc type HTML thing at the top. It doesn't really do anything, I think. I think it just sort of expresses that this is an HTML document when your web browser sees it, so it knows how to handle it. Um, then you have everything has to be wrapped inside an HTML tag. So like this is all the HTML on the screen. Um, I'm not really sure why they have both of these because you should basically be able to infer it from the file type. Um, but all, all, all HTML files have the same structure. Uh, then all HTML files also have a head. Um, so a head tag includes everything to do with sort of meta information about the site. Um, so for example, like the title, um, when you have sort of the name of the site in the, um, in the sort of title of the tab, uh, you can set that value using the title tag inside of the head tag. Um, so as long as you write things exactly like this, then the title will change. Um, we can also link to specific types of files. So we can include CSS here, for example. Uh, that's a really common thing to do in the head. Um, but none of the stuff in the head actually shows up in the screen. <clears throat> Everything on the screen uh, we have to write inside of this body tag. Um, so we'll write other HTML elements inside of the body and then that's what ultimately shows up on the screen. Um, so we'll show a little example of that in a couple of minutes. Um, the last thing I wanna do is just talk about the different types of HTML element. Um, there's a table here with lots of different options for HTML. Um, a couple I mentioned already is, um, yeah, the image tag. Uh, this is one that pops up quite a lot, IMG. Um, the A tag defines a link to another site, so a hyperlink. Um, we'll go into these in a bit more detail next lecture, uh, but just to give, give you an idea that there are lots of these different uh, elements out there. Uh, don't worry about learning all of these right now. We'll get that with some time with experience. Um, okay, and the last thing I wanna do today is talk about the Chrome developer tools. Um, so one of the exercises for this week's homework is going to be to uh, play around with these dev tools and just sort of look under the hood of the web a little bit um, and just sort of fiddle around with lots of things uh, that we don't usually get to see. Um, so these developer tools, uh, you might have seen this before as like the element inspector of a website. Um, so all web browsers pretty much have one of these. Uh, I think Chrome is one of the better ones uh, in terms of what you can do as a developer. Um, but on the right here, we can see the HTML that makes up a particular website. Um, so here we are on the new booklet site. Um, this isn't live yet. This is on my local machine. Um, we can always open up this uh, element inspector by, I'll just close this down so that we can see it for now. Uh, if you right click somewhere on the screen uh, and click inspect right at the button, uh, then it opens up this element inspector here where we can see all of the HTML elements that make up a page. Um, and uh, if we hover over one of these elements, it sort of shows us which part of the page this refers to. Uh, and this is a great tool for debugging things, playing around with styling, uh, and just sort of interrogating the, con the content of a page to, uh, to figure out what's going on. Um, Okay, so uh, if we sort of, I'm just gonna put this away a little bit. 
Um, we can see the exact same scaffolding that we had a few slides ago. Um, so we have this doc type HTML at the top. Uh, everything else is wrapped in an HTML tag. Uh, then we have this head element, which doesn't actually show up on the screen. Um, this includes a bunch of different links and somewhere there should be a title. Uh, title, title here. So there's the title. That's what shows up in the tab here. Um, and as I mentioned, the body is basically everything else on the screen. Um, and inside this body, okay, we have lots of other HTML tags that are showing how everything should look. Um, so this is the HTML tag for the sidebar, for example, then this is the sort of the main content area. Uh, and all of this sort of stitches together with some styling to make what actually shows up on the screen. Okay. Um, so that's the element inspector. Uh, another really cool thing to check out with the Chrome developer tools is the console. Um, we're going to be using this console repeatedly uh, as we cover React. Um, sometimes in the console at different websites, you can see some fun developer messages that companies have left uh, because this isn't usually something that a regular user would see. Um, so there's going to be like a little fun project this week if anyone can find one of these developer messages on a website and share it with the Discord. Um, that's really cool to be able to find that out sometimes. Uh, you'll also often see lots of warnings and errors. Um, so there's a bunch of warnings about uh, stuff wrong with my React code here. Um, this is an actual error that I'm not really sure where it's coming from. Uh, like even with really well-developed, uh, you know, serious products with hundreds of developers, there are always errors in this console. Um, so maybe that's another thing that you could find uh, with your homework this week of playing around with some of this, this stuff in the console. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is this network tab. Uh, so if I refresh my page here, we can see all of these uh, new lines coming up in this table. And we can actually click on one of these and we can see that each one of these represents a different HTTP request that we're making to the server. Um, so this is another thing that I just want you to check out this week, um, sort of play around with these different things and see what's going on. Um, we can also always see the sort of request headers that sort of describing things about this request. Um, and we can also see the response that we get back, which is usually some sort of file uh, of some description from the server. Okay. Um, great. So this week's homework, um, as I mentioned, one of the parts is going to be playing around with this Chrome developer tools. Um, we're going to be writing our first few lines of HTML code. Uh, so for that, we'll be using a site called Free Code Camp, which you may have heard of before. Uh, Free Code Camp is an awesome online free utility for learning how to code. Um, and the great thing about Free Code Camp is that it comes with an online editor where you can play around and write code by yourself. Uh, and you can see immediately uh, HTML updating what's on the screen. Um, so that's a really good way of getting started without having to download anything, without having to work with the command line yet, um, which is always kind of a daunting pro uh, prospect when you first start out. Um, and other than that, we have a few videos for the homework this week, uh, just on the building blocks of the web, uh, understanding how everything's fitting together uh, in a little bit more detail than I explained today. Um, so, as usual, there are going to be two different sets of homework. There's going to be the initial homework, the, uh, the sort of uh, mandatory homework for sticking with the course. Uh, that should take roughly about an hour. And if you get done with that and you still want to learn, then there's also the bonus homework, which will be a little bit more stuff. Uh, so, there'll be some more videos and uh, there's going to potentially be a project for this week um, actually using HTML on your local machine and making a project by yourself, just sort of trying to replicate something that I give you 